Get a Book Dot Today presents For the Honor of the Captain, Book Two in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet Series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2019. He is Shane Lachlan Black, the Internet's original stunt writer. Computer, is everything ready? Affirmative. All systems report nominal operations. As you can see, the channel is approaching a major milestone, and since we have the best readers in known space, we figured it was about time for a party. So we came up with the 5x5 five five celebration. We'll be publishing five new audiobooks on getabook.today shortly. Between now and when we hit 5,000 subscribers, if you buy any two audiobooks from our store, you get the third title of your choice absolutely free. We've got the first three novels in the Starships at War series, introducing the captain, officers, and crew of Defender Starship Argent and her escort fleet of heroic warships. We've got Battle Force, the Praetorian Imperative, Bloodwing, and Let None Return Alive. Four titles from the Expeditionary Fleet and Destroy All Starship series, and it won't be long before the rest of the catalog joins them. Why, we've even got an audiobook title from my Lady Star fantasy adventure universe called The Secret of the Witch Wand, my Kings and Conquests gamelet series, my nonfiction titles, the all new voyages of the Bonnie Lass, and possibly even a couple of my romance novellas just might find their way to the audiobook section of my store sooner than you think. Remember, you can always buy my books as gifts, and when it comes to fun and exciting stories, every single one of my series is just like the Starship's universe, action-packed and carrying maximum firepower. No DRM, no apps, no passwords, no format hassles, hours of uninterrupted entertainment. Listen to my audiobooks on any device, secure ordering plus, a seven day, no questions asked, money back guarantee. My first online store was live at 95, baby, and I treat my customers like royalty. We are on the march to 5,000. Do I have to say it? All ahead, battle speed! Chapter 15. Helm, hard over. New heading 316 relative. Pitch, negative 10 sequential. Flank 3. M Momentum shifted on the burning bridge of the Rhode Island as her white-hot engines drove the plasma-trailing starship through Kraken space. She was still three million miles from the Rho Theta frontier. Every second she was out of position made her a fine target for the lethal proton fire from the as-yet unidentified ship. Report tactical. Tropical 8 closing. Range 150,000 miles on oblique quarter intercept course bearing 145 Mark 60. Reinforce aft shields. Signals get me a channel to fury. Subspace interference is overwhelming our transmission matrix, sir. I can't. Helm, reverse your turn. 35 Mark 5. Maintain speed. Weps, prep a full spread of manted birds. Concussion warheads. Disengage safeties. Lock aft weapons on target and await my command. The weapons officer hesitated and glanced at Executive Officer Boyle. The look in her eyes told him she had full confidence in the captain. The younger officer configured the weapons with trembling fingers. If one of the missiles misinterpreted a jolt, electrical signal, or even a change in temperature, it could go off, and at this speed, such an accident would turn one of Skywatch's most powerful warships and several dozen highly trained crew members into about a half million miles of radioactive debris. Missiles armed. Moments later, the destroyer screamed into Rho Theta space, drawing every last molecule of energy from her drive field and dangerously sapping the power from her battle screens. Tropical 8 remained in hot pursuit only seconds behind. Its primary weapon was fully charged. It hadn't fired in some time, but that likely had more to do with the fact such a small ship probably didn't have the spare power to break Rhode Island's electronic warfare interference while it was simultaneously jamming the larger vessel's communications. Every Skywatch crew member and officer learned the value of electronic countermeasures long before they covered weapon systems. The truth could be found in the records of every deep space engagement. 
9 out of 10 battles were won or lost without a shot being fired. This battle, however, was one of the exceptions. The waveform and bearing slid into synchronization on the weapons officer's scope. Missiles locked on target Tropical 8. Walsh leaned forward out of his con chair. Fire! Rhode Island banked to starboard and rolled out of the deflection zone as her primary missiles tore through space on wildly divergent bearings. The smaller pursuer didn't appear to have any point defense. For that matter, it didn't seem to have a drive field either. Neither disadvantage stopped it from rolling and corkscrewing through the impact patterns of Walsh's manted spread. The spherical ship resumed its pursuit course with plasma fires trailing from its hull. An instant later, it opened up on the destroyer again. Its accuracy was off, but even the potential of another hit aft made Rhode Island's crew jittery. Evasive, Walsh shouted. The rapid-fire proton beams ripped into the number six battle screen. The blasts and secondary detonations shook the deck plates again and again. The bridge lights flickered, went out, then came back on again. The overhead console at the SRS station blacked out and began to cough acrid black smoke. Again, Tropical 8 launched a pulverizing barrage. The searing white proton beams flashed and scorched Rhode Island's dorsal battle screens. Her number three engine's power levels surged momentarily and then went dark. A frightening thump shattered the auxiliary engineering deck and finally ejected a fiery tangle of machinery and electronics through the engine's exhaust port. A magnesium fire caught in the power transfer chamber. Burning white plasma began to trail from the destroyed propulsion unit. Engineering. Report. Power levels are down 14%, sir. If we don't shut down main fusion, we're looking at a deck pressure overheat in just under nine minutes. What are your orders, sir? XO. Range to fury. 2.6 million miles. Too far, Walsh muttered. Engineering, cut power to our drive field and prepare to bring the Rhode Island about. Acknowledged, Bridge. Patina out. Helm, give me a wide arc evasive course to port and slow to one half. Transfer all power to communications. Paul, you're going to get all the power I can give you. Either you punch through that interference or that's the ball game. Acknowledged? The young signals officer swallowed hard. Aye, sir. I won't let you down. With Tropical 8 closing range, Rhode Island began a sweeping turn, bringing her forward weapons back into firing position. As the engine power levels subsided, the signal station found itself with enormous surpluses of main energy. The communications bank flickered and cycled as the new power was routed to the destroyer's largest and most potent antenna array. The auto systems were locked into position and began broadcasting automated distress directly at the last known position of the cruiser Fury. Walsh snapped his shock harness as a shadowy look of resolve settled across his face. Tropical 8 bore in, locking its weapons on the Rhode Island Bridge and preparing for the final shot. All remaining power to weapons. Chapter 16 What's your name? Technical Sword Saxon, Capita, the proximant croaked weakly. I'm afraid I've misplaced my Kumu Cations equipment. Do you remember what happened here? Commander Islington asked. Unusual vessel, spherical in shape. We initially concluded it was a SAR design of some kind. It approached from the Mycenae SETI system. Its first attack knocked out our power systems. By the time we were able to restore our defenses, it had landed troops on this deck. They had some kind of environmental weapon. We fought as best we could, but their numbers were too great. Where is the rest of the crew? Hunter asked. On upper decks, Saxon replied. They are using a scattering field. It interferes with our short-range scanners and sensor equipment. They can mask life and biological readings up to 200 yards distant. Islington looked up at Hunter. The two captains exchanged a knowing glance. The technician had just confirmed their theory. Rest a minute, you're safe now. The proximate nodded as Commander Islington got to her feet and joined Hunter a few steps away. Corporal Gray checked the feline's vital signs again. We have a problem, Rebecca said. Hunter nodded. We can't tell how many of those things are on this station, and we still don't know where their ship went. Let's get some manpower from Fury and... The commander's comlink lit up. Huggins to Captain. Jace activated the device. Go ahead, Fury. And, uh, we have a distress call from Rhode Island. She is under attack. Space vessel. Identity unknown. Set general quarters. Plot an intercept course. I'm on my way. Jace ran to the hatch and activated the permanent bypass. The door slid away to reveal three huge bear-like creatures in heavy power armor. They were just as surprised as the commander. 
Jace wheeled back and drew her TK-10 as the Marine behind Islington aimed and opened fire. The overpressure from the energy rifle nearly knocked Islington unconscious. An unpleasant scream echoed in the corridor as Jace fought to secure the door. One of the creatures interposed itself and struggled to get through the hatch as the door repeatedly tried to close against its armor. It took a swipe at Jace and nearly caught a fistful of her hair. Jace activated her comlink. Hunter to Fury, assist Rhode Island, don't wait for me, go. The Marine fired again, blasting a four-inch divot in the composite frame next to the alien creature's head. The bulky alien waved a pistol wildly, trying to return fire. The weapon went off and blasted the insides out of the overhead lights. The room fell into darkness. The only light source was coming through the small window in the storage cabin hatch. Islington leaped across the room to get to her utility belt as two more of her marines leveled weapons at the creature in the door. Before they could fire, the creature lobbed a small electronic device into the room. It rolled across the floor near Commander Islington's knees. That's their weapon! It will kill us all! The proximan barked. Corporal Gray dove on the device at once, looking for any kind of arming switch or control mechanism. Lacking time, he threw the device into the opposite corner and grabbed the pistol out of his commander's hands. An instant before it went off, two rounds from the TK-10 blasted it into wreckage. The creature in the door howled in frustration as it realized its attack had failed. A moment later, a well-aimed blast from Over's TK-40 rendered it unconscious. Commander Hunter slid down the wall to the floor. She let the pistol in her hand clatter to the floor as well. Giant alien bears with grenades or unidentified alien ships, but one at a time. Agreed, Corporal. Yes, ma'am. Chapter 17 Hold your fire! It wasn't often Jason Hunter had to be the intermediary urgently shouting for peace, but in this case, had he not ordered his marines to stand down, they would have killed unarmed targets. The Proximan Human Landing Party's sensor devices had led them to an obscure corner of the Triton complex. The life signs on this planet weren't being hidden or interfered with, so the signals on the Atmas handhelds were as clear as a bell. They were located inside one of the out-of-the-way electronic storage buildings, one level below the main complex. Several metal staircases and at least one automated heavy lift platform were installed to service the structure. Its lights and power were also active. The readings, on the other hand, were not subject to debate. Sarn. And now, even Captain Hunter had confirmed it. Colonel Moody's Marines had shorted one of the electronically locked doors and streamed in, lights and weapons at the ready. Shouts and commands echoed. In a matter of a few seconds, the dog block regulars had two dozen unarmed Sarn civilians up against a wall and bathed in white light. None of them looked hostile, but humans had always had an atavistic reaction to reptiles. They didn't have to be hostile to provoke a human response. Can you understand me? Hunter barked. Do you have a translator? The captain made sure to engage his own interpreter. None of their caution would matter much if they shot someone over a misunderstood phrase. Even the Sarn adults looked like they were freezing. We understand you, human, one of the larger and darker-skinned ones croaked. I am Elav, the leader of our clan. May I know your name? I'm Captain Jason Hunter of the Alliance Starship Argent. This is Lord Captain Oakshot of the Royal Proximan Sloop Bree Saw Yen. We were under the impression this facility was automated. What is your authorization for being in this facility? This place is an automated reminder of our burden, Captain. The energy and heavy metals produced here are used to make weapons that are aimed at our children and our homes. So you are here to sabotage this facility? Moo asked. Of course not. We are pacifists, Captain. We have seen enough war to last us all ten lifetimes. We fled our homes to find a better place to raise our children. This planet was as far as we could get before our ship's engines failed. We barely managed to build ourselves shelter out of what was remaining. You have your own shelter here? Hunter asked. We do. Would you like to see it? Hunter and Oakshot exchanged glances. The captain made the decision and holstered his own weapon. The rest of the landing party followed Hunter's example. I'm afraid it is some distance, Captain. The water storage facility on this base is efficient, but it is also built in an area that is very treacherous and hard to reach on foot. I understand. I'm told Triton was designed to be serviced from the air. The terrain on M-78 isn't exactly rolling hills and green grass. No, it is not, Captain. We will need to traverse one of this complex's subterranean tunnels, 
we will emerge on a rocky platform that is thankfully well shielded from the hottest catacombs below. Let us show you the way. Let's just hope they weren't like the unwise man who built his house on shifting sands, Moo muttered as the landing party followed Elov towards the water storage area. Chapter 18 After the yeoman declared the meeting classified and announced Admiral Powers, the officers of Skywatch Southern Banner rapidly concluded their hushed conversations and settled in for the briefing. Powers had chosen the primary strategic affairs facility for this meeting. The room was decorated in muted blues and silvers and surrounded by 20-foot-wide monitors displaying everything from live video of the core prime seat of government to telemetry from distant repeaters and planet-orbiting relay probes. The sergeant major called the room to attention as Powers entered. Captain Crowell entered a step behind the admiral and went to his place at the table. Powers stood at the head of the conference and invited the attendees to be seated. The displays faded to black and then all switched to displays of the Skywatch crest. I will make all of you the same offer I've made to everyone else in this operation. I am going to discuss some things here that may have legal consequences for you. Some of those consequences may come from civilian authority. I don't say these things lightly, as I am a law-abiding citizen of the Core Alliance. That said, it is my sincere belief as a Skywatch officer there may be no Core Alliance or laws to abide by if we don't address the threat now looming in the Kraken sector. Some of the officers exchanged looks as the yeoman brought a map of the Kraken expanse up on the display behind the Admiral. A strategic overlay had been applied showing estimated fleet strength in five regions, Gelfos, Mycenae Seti, Atlantis, Kraken, and Rho Theta. The key feature of the map was the supply line leading from Atlantis space through the Kraken expanse and into Rho Theta. As strategic experts, all the officers in the room were well aware of the implications. They were also all aware of the legal implications as well. A Sarn battlecruiser opened fire on the battleship Argent under the command of Captain Jason Hunter in the Kraken region only days ago. According to her executive officer and commander Starwing, the Empire is establishing battle groups in three systems bordering Gitarn, Rho Theta, Prairie Grove, and El Rey. Each of the space regions were highlighted by the Yeoman as the Admiral spoke. It is Hunter's belief they are preparing to advance into core space, capturing key jump gates at Blackburn, Missouri, and Descartes, and reinforcing through Atlantis. Admiral, it is my duty to remind you this subject is off limits, said Vice Admiral Dexter Jackson. Noted, Admiral. Powers replied. The silence hung ominously in the room for several moments. Jackson wasn't entirely convinced Powers was serious until he saw the man stare back at him without so much as a second breath. As I said in my opening, anyone who feels uncomfortable with this topic is welcome to excuse themselves at this time. More silence. Finally, Commander Joyce Nordreth and Captain Ronald Gunderman rose, gathered their folios, and strode to the double doors. A few officers watched them go. No others adjourned. What was our response to this attack, Admiral? One of the other flag officers asked. A good portion of his intent was to get the briefing back on track before two officers became twenty. Hunter followed regulations and returned fire to the extent necessary to protect his command. Major Komanov identified the attacking ship as the Kralex, last known to be under the command of a seventh dragon by the name of Vadak. The ship was apparently operating independently. This is the kind of thing we've come to expect from Imperial warships. They launch isolated attacks so as to give the Emperor deniability if our government protests. Admiral, I'm sure I don't have to ask the obvious question, Crowell interrupted. That was Powers' agreed-upon cue. A high-definition shot of a Kraken attack craft appeared on the screen behind Powers. He allowed the assembled officers to react. It was the first time any of them had been briefed on the possible existence of a second faction in the region, and it was also the first time any of them had seen a Kraken ship. They call themselves the Kraken Descartes. They have made no attempt to contact our government, aside from two attacks on allied targets in Rho Theta space and at least one attack on a neutral target in the Mycenae Seti system. According to the executive officer aboard Fury, they also nearly disabled the destroyer Rhode Island with a single attacking ship. Their weapon is a rapid-fire proton beam that seems to not only be their preferred attack technology, but it also seems to be the primary system their ships are built around. 
the largest of these vessels displaces more than 3 million tons and mounts a beam weapon that can conduct sustained assault operations from orbit. Our codename for it is the World Burner. The only other class of ship we have seen so far is the much smaller 15,000-ton fast attack vessel. What are the relative power levels of these weapons, Ben? Admiral Don Johansson asked. Power stepped aside and allowed one of the Gale River technicians to take the question. He stepped to the lectern as the yeoman switched to a table showing several beam weapons and their respective measurements. Using our cruiser-based Spectre emplacements as a base estimate, we begin with a destructive energy potential of 80 kilotons per weapon per discharge on a 6-second reload cycle, or 13 kilotons a second. This is classified in Skywatch ship design records as a Force 10 beam weapon. A Force 1 weapon, by comparison, is what used to be mounted on the first-generation Bearcat perimeter fighter shuttles. It had a destructive output of just under 0.25 kilotons per discharge with a 0.5 second reload cycle, or 0.5 kilotons per second. We measure the energy output and destructive potential of all other beam weapons and missile payloads in our tactical databases using this scale for reference. Powers stepped back up to the head of the table. Our initial data shows the weapons used against the starship Sussex had a power level of approximately Force 17. Those deployed against Rhode Island were Force 19. Gasps preceded excitable whispers. Powers rapped on the lectern with the gavel block. So you're saying these Kraken ships, these smaller ships with displacements of 15,000 tons or less, mount primary weapons equivalent to what Skywatch reserves for battleships? That is correct, Admiral. Now I hope you are all beginning to understand the threat we face. We spent years believing the Sarn had given up their ambitions of conquest, and now we need to face the facts. We were wrong. They were not licking their wounds. They were finding a bigger and more aggressive civilization to join forces with, and the Kraken bring formidable warfighting technology with them. Which brings you to the elephant in space, Admiral Jackson said. This supply line is not based on a guess, ladies and gentlemen. Repeater 5 has picked up signals coming from Atlantis space. Their origin was backplotted to Akane transmitters. Admiral, we can't fight it if we don't know what it is, Dex, Powers replied with a little extra edge in his voice. There is no regulation against reporting the facts. But that supply line you have on the strategic map goes right through the Omicron 474 supermassive singularity. Nothing can navigate in that region of space. We can't even get LOS transmissions to operate properly within a light day of that thing. Subspace transmissions anywhere near there might as well be written in Sanskrit. They would be gibberish. Nevertheless, we received clear signals four days ago, and we have verified readings of Kraken ships navigating within a light hour of the Atlantis border. All five of the intercepts were tracked approaching Rho Theta space. They are on a build-up to something, and we had better not only find out what it is, but mobilize to meet it head-on, or we're going to lose both the Initiative and Gitern, and that puts both the Sarn and the Kraken on our doorstep. I'm fairly certain I don't need to remind any of you the President's daughter is missing. She was last seen on Mycenae Seti IV. Are we going to war to protect the First Family? We're going to do our duty, Powers replied. Our mission is to defend the Core Alliance, and in order to carry out that mission, we need to be prepared before the first shot is fired. There are limits to that metaphor, Admiral, Jackson said. That why I tell the story of the sleeping dad, Powers said with a you-asked-for-it grin. Seems there was once a dad who lived in a home with his wife and many children. Each night before he retired, he checked all the windows and doors to make sure his home was secure. He also checked to make sure he had a weapon in case the worst happened. He was a conscientious father who loved his family and didn't want them harmed. The assembled officers listened as the admiral told his story. The dad's friends would always ask him what his plans were given all his advance preparations. He would always reply with the same rhetorical question. How can I best protect my family? Is it better for me to be suddenly awakened by an intruder and then decide how to handle the problem? Or is it better if I have a plan? Defensive preparations and a weapon ready when the suspect is five miles away. His friends would roll their eyes and wave at him dismissively until he followed up with, I'm never going to have to fight an intruder. He would never explain exactly what he meant by that statement, but the wise among you will know. In this house, I'm dad, and I'm never going to fight an intruder either. There was contemplative silence after Power's story. 
he was standing before an audience of senior and, in some cases, flag-level officers from multiple branches of service. He knew they were all intelligent enough to understand his morality tale and the symbolism that gave it meaning. What's your plan, Admiral? Powers nodded to the yeoman and the display behind him changed to a strategic deployment map for the region. Our first priority is to order Captain Hunter to investigate the Akane system and determine the origin of the signals Repeater 5 has intercepted. Without escort? Jackson exclaimed. Argent has her star wing and her gunships and a full complement of ground forces if they are needed. Against how many Kraken ships? Captain Crowell asked. That doesn't matter if he can avoid them, Powers said. With Argent deployed to Atlantis, I propose to deploy Strike Fleet Achilles to the Rho Theta system to serve as point for establishing a battle line in three systems to include Prairie Grove and El Rey. Admiral Hafnitz will command St. Lucia and Cristobal Vasquez. I will order Strike Fleet Athena reactivated at once. I will assign the heavy battleships Kingsblade and Sea Dragon to anchor their battle group. As Powers spoke, avatars representing each group and each ship appeared on the display. Each of the heavy battleships was designated by her class abbreviation and hull number. Kingsblade was BBX-17, St. Lucia was BBX-11, Cristobal Vasquez was CC-312. Our carrier strength will be built around Song of Heaven and her group and reinforced by the fast carrier Nemia and the experimental battlecruiser Wisconsin. El Rey will be reinforced by the Kratos Task Force and strike battleship Bushido. Task Force 39 consisting of the Alexandria, Sierra, Nathaniel Green and Klondike will stand ready at Blackburn to reinforce Achilles or Song of Heaven as needed. What about Hunter and Fury? Commander Plank asked. Task Force Perseus was disbanded after the Bayonne incident, Crowell replied. Well, hadn't we better rethink that decision, sir? Crowell took a breath to answer, then realized he had no reply. What is the current estimate of what we're up against? Commodore Hansen asked. Komanov thinks we may be looking at eight battle groups or their equivalent. Eight battle groups? Crowell turned in his chair, reacting as if someone had fired a pistol behind him. That's going to require us to mobilize our entire strength, Ben. Admiral Jackson said. And even then, we can't match that kind of tonnage. If things escalate any further, we're going to need to call up ships from other commands. At the moment, I only have five viable capital platforms, and only one of those has a fully provisioned battle group. I'm also at only 40% of my marine strength, and half of that is aboard Hunter's battleship. Hadn't we? We can't take anything from Argent. No telling what she might be up against. Avoiding trouble is a best-case scenario. It's also something Captain Hunter isn't very good at. Sir, you realize once you give that order you're subject to arrest, Jackson said. The anti-alarmists will have a field day with this. You'll all have to decide which is the best way to defend humanity, Powers replied. Court-martial me or mobilize Southern Banner to protect Gitarin. Nobody replied. Powers closed his folio. The display behind him switched to the formal flag of the Southern Banner High Command. We're adjourned. Chapter 19 Hunter didn't want to abandon his team, especially after discovering a community of Sarn separatists on the surface of M. Seti 8, but his obligations as captain of Argent took precedence over his personal preferences. Within an hour of the notification he had received new orders, Command 1 had been dispatched from Argent's position to return him to his ship. It was escorted by no fewer than four Wildcat fighters from the 85th Squadron known as Los Gatos. Once he was aboard, the captain retired to the executive cabin and opened a secure channel to Argent. Thanks for the heads up, Cochrane. What's our status? We're still at alert, too. No word yet from Schroeder or the medical corvette aside from position updates. I expect a report on the efforts to determine what happened to Sussex from Captain Stone within the hour. Rhode Island apparently had a bit of a tangle with an unidentified ship we believe is Kraken in origin. Fury has been dispatched to relieve Captain Walsh. The situation on the Proximan station is a stalemate, and you know what the situation is in M-City. Operation Swift Steed is ready to launch when you return. Everyone has been briefed. You also have a priority communique from Southern Banner, which I expect contains new orders. That's the most comprehensive sit rep I think I've ever heard, Commander. Thank you, sir. My sister won't be able to taunt me about missing any details in the future I can see. Oakshot and Moo are going to need reinforcements. Let's stand up 12th Mechanized and get a platoon down there aboard two paladins with survival gear and a heavy comm emplacement so we can keep in regular contact. Affirmative. 
How much later is Strike Fleet Achilles going to be? I don't mind holding the fort, but if I'm going to live here, I want to put up new drapes. I have two requests for rendezvous updates into St. Lucia's exec. No response so far. Near as we can tell, Hafnet's entire battle group is still in Gitaran space. Fat lot of good they're doing us here. Very well, Commander. Patch me to Anora. The video feed switched to Argent's Raptor logo for a moment. When it was restored, Anora was on flight two. The Nightwing search and rescue corvette was right behind her. How much time do you need? We're ready to launch now. Sergeant Alexander and Ariane are ready to deploy. Aaron tells me we can be on the deck in eight hours. You're in operational command. Get in, get Shay, and get out. And for heaven's sake, don't shoot at anything. If something kicks off out there, we won't be able to get assistance to you for at least half a day. Acknowledged. We'll bring her home, Jason. This is what we trained for. I know. I'm counting on it, Doctor. Godspeed. Command one out. Hunter looked out the window at the lazily floating starfield and the wing fighter keeping pace with his shuttle. He punched the intraship. ETA to Argent? Four hours, twenty-six minutes, sir. Very well? It wasn't very well at all. Hunter's entire crew seemed to be everywhere but his home base. He had fighters in one system, two infill teams in a second system, and a medium-sized war raging on the Proximan space station. Argent couldn't go anywhere because it had to be headquarters for all the confusion going on around it. One could only guess what might happen if that Sarn battlecruiser popped up again. And now he was cooped up in a comfortable box with engines attached to it for the next four hours. He had to admit things were a little unusual with Commander O'Malley around. He was a very different bird from the hotshots he initially recruited to run his ship. It turned out to be a much bigger job than any of them thought. But if it weren't, they wouldn't have gotten the chance to serve with other hotshots like Major Komanov, Commander McGrath, and Commander O'Malley. The new XO was the kind of guy who made the trains run on time, and to be fair, that's exactly what Argent needed. Acting Commander Mallory didn't fail at her job. She was simply outmatched by the circumstances. Hunter couldn't fly into a war zone without a force commander or a second chair. Not only would it be a tremendous risk, it would be a violation of numerous regulations. Granted, if she had been a casualty, that would have been one thing, but Sabrina Mallory was anything but. Aside from his sister, Jason had never seen anyone clear bookwork and simulation batteries like Sabrina had. She was a good officer and would one day be highly qualified, but she wasn't the kind of officer Argent needed at the moment. As reactionary and loud as the Admiralty had been about the Bayonne operation, they were right about one thing. Mallory was in line to be a cruiser skipper. Someday, but not now. Hunter had never been a fan of the detail-oriented approach. Leadership had been described to him once as the guy who points into the distance and says, that's where we're going. There had to be a guy like that, his professor said, because without him people have a tendency to go in all directions instead of one. That's fine if you're running an amusement park, he continued. But if you're trying to get something important accomplished, it's not exactly the optimum set of conditions. A leader with a details guy in the command structure was fortunate, however, as it gave him the perfect division of responsibilities. What the Jacks had discovered was that leadership was the universal solvent in human endeavor. It acted as a lubricant in tough political and economic situations and became corrosive only when applied to stupidity. Hunter had encountered his fair ration of idiots over the years, and the one thing he had learned above all else when dealing with God's special creatures was that stupidity was anti-leadership. The two reacted to each other like matter and antimatter. Both Jason and his sister applied this principle in their other studies and found the results to be painfully consistent when there was more stupid than leaders. The converse was also true. History was replete with examples of both. The good news, at least as far as the crew of the Argent was concerned, was that her captain and her senior officers were all of a mind when it came to principles of leadership and excellence. While their captain wasn't a details guy, he was most certainly goal-oriented, and his personality was such that he refused to accept defeat even when for all intents and purposes it was a foregone conclusion. It was the entire basis of the myth that had grown up around the bandit jacks. They stole victory. They took from fate that which they did not earn. Some might have credibly believed that meant someday Jason Hunter would have hell to pay. In the meantime, he was on a winning streak for the ages, and he wasn't about to give up his built-in advantage just yet. Neither was his sister. But that wasn't all that was on the captain's mind. 
Elav, the Sarn separatist leader, and his words troubled Hunter. The captain had always been a believer in fair play. The concept of the strong victimizing the weak had always annoyed him going all the way back to his days as a young boy in school. Hunter was always the first to stick up for the picked-on kid. He was always the baseball team captain who picked the scrawny teammate first and encouraged him even if he wasn't very good at hitting or fielding. What was there to be gained by grinding people down under boot and burden? Jason had gotten the same vibe from the scared group of Sarn civilians on M-78. The Empire was on the warpath, and if they would leave it at that and make war against a worthy and equal opponent, that would be one thing. But that's not what happened. Instead, they were making war against their own brothers and sisters, against their own children and future. If Hunter hadn't already seen it in action, he wouldn't have believed it. As evil as Sarn could be, they weren't all honorless cowards. Any race capable of reaching for the stars had to have some kind of admirable reason for throwing themselves out into space and looking for answers to the big questions. One of those big questions was plainly obvious. Why would such a race go so far out of its way to victimize? Why not put that time and energy towards something productive that could secure the future of the powerless instead of foreclosing on it? For all his outrage, Hunter had to admit he had seen the same kind of behavior among humans. There was some flavor of mental illness, Jason believed, that drove men to attack weakness and then to become obsessed with their hostility. Closest Jason Hunter had ever come to being arrested on a public street was the time he had emerged from a ceremonial function at a core prime restaurant to find two civilian police officers harassing an old man who was clearly on public assistance. Nobody else took up for the man, so Jason intervened. At the time, he was wearing his Class A blue-on-white dress uniform. That earned him enough of a pause from the two officers to coax the man to safety and to get him to remain quiet long enough to get out of the area. When one of the cops pursued the man to continue his harassment, Hunter restrained the officer, which drew the attention of several of his friends from the party. An hour later, after masterful negotiation by Hunter's CO at the time, the captain was let off with the strongest of warnings by the civilians, and a, what the hell were you thinking, from Commander Owens. Jason knew if he had it to do all over again, he would have done exactly the same thing. There was a sense of honor that came with being in a position to protect others from obvious injustice. While it was trite to presume everything the Sarn aimed weapons at was a victim, it was clear in this situation there were more than a few Sarn civilians who would prefer to govern themselves, possibly even under a system that wasn't led by an all-powerful emperor. That was also a mindset the captain understood well. His ancestors came from a land called Home of the Free and Land of the Brave, after all. Standing up to authority may as well have been engraved into the family crest. But that wasn't the only consideration. While Jason Hunter was likely to stand up to authority and speak truth to power, he also recognized the practical limits of his idealism. At the moment, at least as far as Skywatch was concerned, in this region of space, he was the authority. He didn't have the luxury a separatist civilian had. Balancing everyone's priorities and keeping them alive besides was going to test the limits of the captain's authority. Hunter was simply hoping he had the creativity to handle it all. Hunter reactivated the intership. Miles, patch me into Zoni station on the bridge. Aye, sir. Switching nets. Bridge, Tixia. Zoni, pipe the Admiral's priority message to me here on Command 1. There will be a short delay for encryption. Acknowledged. Stand by. A few moments later, the familiar icon representing Southern Banner Fleet Command appeared on Jason's monitor. He listened carefully to Admiral Power's message and understood all the implications at once. Good and bad. He punched the comm. Pilot, disregard safeties. Get me to Argent. Fastest possible speed.